Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Dr. Irakli Loladze. He earned his BA degree in applied mathematics in Georgia, the former USSR, not Atlanta. After earning his MA and PhD in mathematics at Arizona State University, Irakli, as a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University, advanced a hypothesis that rising atmospheric CO2 is affecting human nutrition by worsening the quality of plants worldwide. It took him 12 years to collect the empirical evidence confirming the hypothesis. He is now an associate professor of biomedical sciences at Bryan College of Health Sciences, Bryan Medical Universe, Medical Center. So first off, thank you for doing all this very important work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So my first question is, so what is the relationship between atmospheric CO2 and uh, the nutritional value of plants, and how did you come across it? I see. So you know, CO2 is the basic raw ingredient for plants to build their biomass. Um, what they do, I mean, what photosynthesis is, is that uh, plants take those CO2 molecules in the air and uh, then they uh, split the water molecules and they take, you know, hydrogen from water molecules, and combine it with CO2 and make sugar and starches. And, um, you know, when there is more CO2, then they make more sugar and starches. And um, the quality or other nutrients uh, might end up being diluted. Um, this is in the very simple uh, and basic uh, terms, but of course, plants are much more uh, complex organisms, and um, it's one of the reasons I had so much um, uh, so much uh, resistance to, to 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 advancing it and and uh, convincing people that that that's happening. Um, you know. The plants are very interesting organisms. They actually make their own food. And imagine being stuck at one place. You can't move. And you have to synthesize, literally, a food from just basic, uh, you know, elements in the soil. And um, that's why plants, I mean, they're very, very complex. They're like, for example, wheat, uh, wheat has uh, the number of genes is several times larger than human genome. And um, the, their biosynthesis machinery is, is fascinating, and they have to deal with intermittent supply of you know, nutrients and water uh, or weather, right? They, 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 we, we can't, with our best computers, can't predict weather you know, one month in advance, and plants have to uh, deal with that uh, randomness and uh, uh, make all the food that they they need. And uh, if, if you look from that complexity perspective, there's so much plants can do, like they increase the number of roots so, or, you know, they, they can grow more shoots um, and uh, they, they interact with microorganisms in the soil and they do some kind of trade-offs with those microorganisms. So if you look from that perspective, then um, – then it's 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 not easy to to say what plants gonna do if environment changes, and um, you know plant experts that obviously know so much about plants, they have that the complexity perspective, and so they are reluctant to um, you know maybe accept some um, simple sounding but broad reaching uh, conclusions. But I, I, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I was educated as a mathematician, so I really uh, didn't know much about plants. And in some way, that really what, what helped me, as I was getting my PhD at Arizona State University, I was uh, fortunate to uh, pop up into a lab of a biologist there, uh, Professor James Elser, and uh, he was like looking at all this ecology and biology from very simple perspective of chemical elements. Uh, you know, it, it might sound boring chemical elements, but it was really exciting to me because there are only few basic elements like, you know, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, that, you know, the all life is based upon. And he was looking just at those ratios. And as a mathematician, I thought, okay, so it doesn't matter how 
complicated an organism is, still has to obey basic physical laws, basic uh, chemical laws. And if, if you think from this perspective, then here's two interesting things we can say about plants, right? So plants are this factory, right? They have to make their own food. Well, if they are a factory, then they got to have a storage, right? They have to store somewhere those, you know, raw ingredients and then the products of, of, of this, the output of the factory. And then, indeed, if you look into a plant cell, they would have this huge vacuole, central vacuole, where they can store all kinds of stuff like a warehouse. And when you say eat an apple, juicy apple, a lot of it, what you're actually eating is plant vacuoles. In animal cells, they don't really have those such a big storage compartments because animal cells don't make their own food. So that then means that plants inherently have very flexible chemical composition, plant cells, because they have this huge vacuole. And... Um, when you know when you grow and you're stuck in one place and you know some nutrients might be available might not you become an opportunist so all plants are opportunists if they see there is more of some kind of nutrient they they take it up and of course we took advantage of that that's why this uh, synthetic fertilizer industry um you know is dominates now right uh, all the food production because if you add more nitrogen they definitely respond plants take it up they respond but uh, one thing that we do, and we do it globally, is that we increase CO2, the, the basic ingredient for plants, and, and they definitely take it up. They, they like it. They like there is more CO2, and they start to make more sugars and starches, um, you know, because they just can. And they store that extra starch and sugar in their storage compartments. Um, and it doesn't really hurt them. I mean, they, they, you know, just, just in case they want to have it. Uh, and, uh, while they do that, they absolutely don't care about our nutrition, right? The amount of zinc or magnesium we get, this is not something they really concern about, you know? We actually eat them. So in some way, we're kind of their enemies. And, uh, this, uh, from this simple perspective, if you look at that, then you see there's some global trends, right? Uh, you see, okay, well, plants have chemical, uh, very variable chemical composition, each plant cell, and then we increase globally and largely uniformly the amount of their basic ingredient that, that, that makes uh, sugars and starches. And uh, we know that plants are opportunists, so they're going to take advantage of that. Well, how that will affect us, that's the question I asked while being a, a postdoc. And, um, you know, that's where it took from there. So one would think that increased sugars and increased starches, that doesn't that make it so the plants are tastier? And so any deer who eats eats some of the plant or elk or human or anybody else that's going to actually give them more sugars isn't that more fuel for for the herbivore uh right yes the in fact that uh, the ratio of carbohydrates to protein increases in in most plants worldwide and uh if if a herbivore or plant eater is limited by energy or calories, then uh, there could be a benefit. The problem, of course, with, with humans is that the majority of humans are not limited by calories. If anything, we consume an excess of calories. And uh, why was I really able to connect it to human nutrition is that when I looked at the state of human nutrition, I was shocked to find at the time that the so-called hidden hunger was considered, and I think still is considered, to be the most widespread nutritional disorder in the world. And what is a hidden hunger is that when you get enough calories, but not enough nutrients. Uh, zinc deficiency is affecting over 1 billion uh, people in the world. There are different estimates for calcium deficiency, but one of the most recent ones puts it at the half of all the world's population. 
Iron deficiency is a very big problem in uh, areas with, you know, insufficient meat consumption in uh, mostly plant-based uh, diets, and it's a, especially for uh, women and uh, childbearing women, as they, they, women have a higher requirements for iron than men. And uh, so we talk about billions of people that uh, are are affected and don't get enough nutrients. So that my question was, what will happen if those nutrients uh, decline? So, so in the in some of the early studies, and correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't there? Didn't you study, or didn't didn't weren't there phytoplankton and zooplankton involved? Right. So uh, the, you know the. What's interesting is, um, in some way, how the the ecology developed. Uh, you know, I was a mathematician, but I was keenly interested uh, and still interested in ecology. And uh, when I looked at the this history of the way the ecology developed, there was uh, initially, initially, there was a lot of focus on, you know, also on elements and quality, but but then they really shifted toward energy. You know, like when they analyze the ecosystems, the ecologists will look how much, you know, this energy pyramids, how much energy cascades, how much calories cascade from one trophic level to another level. So uh, when I was working on mathematical models in ecology, population dynamics models, they really practically all of them measured, measured populations purely as, as biomasses. In other words, it was just quantity. Right. And uh, which in some way contradicted with common sense. We know that quality matters, but it was totally absent uh, in in this population dynamics uh, theory. And um, there were some experiments on plankton that started to show that. And, uh, you know, James Elser showed me those experiments, uh, the work of Tom Anderson uh, in, in, in Norway. And uh, where uh, where they, 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 they were the quality of phytoplankton, those tiny green cells that are in the ocean and lakes, that their quality affected zooplankton. And there were also experiments by James Elsworth's colleague, Bob Sterner, uh, with the uh, Jotaro Rabe in Japan, and they actually uh, manipulated the quality of algae or phytoplankton by increasing light. In other words, if you shine more light, then photosynthesis increases, right? Plants love light, uh, you know, up to a point, of course. And so when you increase the light, they start to make more sugars and starches, and uh, the amount of other nutrients dilutes, uh, decreases. And so what they observed was that uh, a zooplankton eating this phytoplankton essentially kind of was starting to eat junk food. It would get enough calories, but not enough uh, phosphorus. That was the limiting nutrient. And is really is in many you know, oceans and, and lakes, and so that that was a very clear, simple, elegant uh, demonstration of food quality uh, affecting population dynamics, affecting how species interact. Uh, in one of the experiments, actually, zooplankton was driven to extinction. In other words, the, the quality was so bad that it was surrounded with all the food but couldn't get those phosphorus, right? And, you know, if you cannot get basic mineral, you are really stuck. Uh, you cannot convert one mineral to another, right? Transmutations are impossible. No organism can trans, uh, can um, uh, convert one element into another. So you literally, I mean, just die. And uh, that's what happened. So that motivated me to come up with a, a very simple mathematical model that would capture that food quality effect. So this, this one of the things you're saying about the various limitations – or, or a limiting, not being limited by energy, but by specific minerals reminds me of studies that have been done about, you know, salmon go out to the ocean and then they, they swim into the forest and then they, they spawn and they die. And that's a huge source of nutrients and one that they followed specifically. I can't remember if it's potassium or phosphorus, but it ends up that forests that have salmon come up them will grow like 30% faster because and they can 
check the isotopes to make sure they came from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it's either potassium or phosphorus, but Mm -hmm. they can... That ends up being one of the limiting factors for the trees next to the stream. And, yeah, there's all sorts of other nutrients and all the, you know, carbon provided by the the fish. But what one of the things that's really important is this either potassium or phosphorus. I don't remember which. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, indeed. uh, Right. So uh, the the salmon then with their biomass are like essentially become uh, fertilizers and, you know, they, they do it for their offspring first of all but but also uh as a side effect uh, they uh feed plants and as i say plants are are opportunists if they see there's this, you know decaying salmon releasing nutrients they grab it up yes and, and plants cannot get carbon from the salmon they cannot get calories right but they will take those minerals and it could be very well the phosphorus could be potassium could be nitrogen it depends what uh what particular element uh, limits um limits uh, that plant generally worldwide worldwide all the primary production are mostly limited by two elements and that is nitrogen and phosphorus and um, uh, because these two elements are in our dna and rna really i mean they are very basic building blocks and that's why not surprising you know humans uh, uh, essentially hijacked the nitrogen cycle where we need to, to feed us we need this nitrogen and we produce synthetic fertilizers and we dump them on agricultural fields to to increase the yield to to make even more food so you're talking about as co2 increases that there the plants will have more sugars and less of some other important nutrients how big of a problem is this is this like it's one percent less or is it 97 percent less and obviously it's going to be different with different plants and different elements but but how big of a problem is this right so you know one of the challenges was uh you know when when i was i was focusing specifically on minerals because you know at at the time in late 1990s we already knew that uh, when co2 increases plants have less nitrogen they actually need less nitrogen and the reason why is because they use nitrogen and specifically enzyme rubisco which is some say is the most uh, you know abandoned uh, abundant protein on earth uh, that, to capture co2 so when you have more co2 in the air plants say hey we don't need that many enzymes to capture co2 and their requirements for nitrogen decline so this was known and the decline was about 15% if you, if you double co2 concentration then uh, nitrogen declines by 15%. And, you know, agronomists view, viewed that as something uh, positive. They they um, they thought, okay, plants, you know, we need less fertilizers. But when you start to look at minerals, first of all, there are many minerals, right? They're like, you know, plants require at least, you know, like 13 different elements. And um, as you mentioned, they're different plants, right, and different climatic conditions. And uh, if you start to analyze, say you, you say you know you run the experiment. He, here is a, here is a wheat in uh, ambient or present CO2 concentrations, and here is a wheat grown in identical c- conditions, but say we, we double CO2 concentration, right? Uh, say from you know 350 parts per million, which was you know like in in 80s 90s to 700 parts per million, which we might experience in our lifetime or our children could experience in their lifetime. So you run those experiments, you start to analyze wheat, and and then you see all kind of disarray. You know, maybe iron increased in one experiment, maybe zinc decreased, maybe changes are statistically not significant and because of the costs scientists use small sample sizes like maybe three four five six so they didn't really see a pattern they didn't see a pattern that some minerals should uh, or uh, decline in all plants in fact uh, the the argument was that you know if plants need nutrients they could grow more roots and get them so uh you know if you look at it from the plant perspective, what a plant needs, then it's hard to make an argument that something should globally decline. But I wasn't looking 
at it from the plant perspective. I was looking at it from what humans need. And, um, and then you see that the plants, because they have this variable composition, they don't mind if they have less zinc. If it doesn't hurt their growth, they can have less zinc. They can have 5, 10, 15%, 20% less zinc. It's not a problem for them. In fact, Yes. In fact, it's kind of good if it makes it less nutritious because that's been the big uh, um, sort of arms race between plants and herbivores for forever is that an herbivore wants to eat the plant and then the plant comes up and with a way to make itself taste bad or to make itself – I mean, the plant doesn't particularly want to be eaten. So if it's less nutritious, hooray for the plant from the plant's perspective. Exactly, absolutely. And in fact, you know, CO2, extra CO2 gives plants, uh, more raw materials. Those starches and sugars they can use to build, you know, different uh, defense compounds against herbivores and, uh, like tannins and, and, uh, and other compounds. So yes, uh, absolutely. Plants uh, don't mind dropping their, uh, nutritional quality where the baseline is what's optimal for consumers, right? Uh, dropping that, that, that quality would actually work, works for them. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the, essentially the uh, big agriculture, is also not concerned about quality. It's primarily yield and, uh, uh, you know, quantity. And in this case, this extra CO2 and, you know, this nitrogen fertilizers, uh, they all contribute to bigger plants, more crops, more yield. But quality, even the concerns about quality are, are really washed out and are not uh, considered uh, routinely because uh, the profit does not depend on the amount of zinc in wheat grains or rice grains. And, and that, that's the, 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 you know, the fundamental problem we face. And I, I know that this is not in, you know, directly in, in your study, but I've also been reading that because of soil depletion that various vegetables have become significantly less nutritious since World War II. And it seems when you combine these, that makes that makes an even worse uh, health problem. You know, combine the increased CO2 with the depletion of soils, and you've got even less nutritional value in the plants. That's right. Yeah, there were two studies. One, there was a British study by Anna Marie Mayer and uh, one in the U.S. by uh, Donald Davis, where they looked at, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables that were contemporary ones and compared those with uh, going back several decades. And they do observe declines in uh, their quality. Now, the question is why, right? And, uh, there are several, several, uh, reasons that could happen, right? Certainly it's the chase for high yields and, and breeding for high yields. So there's a fundamental trade-off between quantity and quality, right? A uh, second thing is that this, yeah, synthetic fertilizers that primarily add nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium because these are the ones that affect the yield. Um, another reason is just generally depletion of soils, right, on a massive scale where uh, these uh, soils are overtaxed and the, 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 you know, all the microbes there and rich flora are, um, you know, essentially um, decimated. Um, so these were, these, these are well known things that, uh, you know, that there is a trade off between quantity and quality and the, the soils deplete, uh, are depleted. Um, but what, what I think also is a contributing factor in the one that, that they, they, you know, the researchers didn't necessarily think of is that CO2 increased uh, and it's increasing every year. Uh, even if we look back at, uh, you know, uh, World War II period, right? Or even if we look at 1980s, uh, CO2 concentration was maybe like, you know, 1980s, maybe 350, 360 parts per million. And now we are like 410 parts per million. So that I think is a factor. Also, why I think CO2 is a factor, because if you look not just at crops, but if you look at wild plants, right, the ones that we don't fertilize, uh, deliberately at least not, and if you look at um, 
at the quality of those plants. And there's a, a Penuelas made such a study. They looked at herbarium specimens several hundred years ago, and they compared with the contemporary ones, and they see that the most minerals declined. Well, that tells you that, you know, that probably very likely, I mean, there were, there were other global changes, you know, warming and so on, but, but, uh, uh, CO2 is one global factor that there is no corner in the world where CO2 concentration is not higher now than it used to be a hundred years ago, right? Or 200 years ago or even 30 years ago. And, uh, I, I believe, I believe that that's a factor. So we, we, you mentioned earlier the the sort of um, the problem of increased uh, obesity and mm-hmm. increased uh, and decreased what do you call it hidden hunger I believe right um, among humans and I want to come back to that in a moment but is this and you also mentioned that in the the laboratory that they the the that in that one experiment the zooplankton went to zero. Is this, to your knowledge, affecting wild, uh, wild creatures' nutrient intake? Is, is this, is this, do you know if this is affecting non-humans? And then we're going to come back to humans in a moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's a good question. So first, uh, there were experiments uh, in 1980s where they grew herbivores, like uh, insects, caterpillars, and, uh, you know, in, uh, in elevated and ambient CO2 concentrations. And so the caterpillars would end up eating more uh, plants, uh, uh, presumably because of lower nitrogen or protein content. And uh, uh, so we, from this perspective, we know it affects herbivores uh, when we talk about basic, you know, protein uh, concentrations. Um, there was a, a fascinating study done recently uh, where they um, analyzed cow poop. They they have these uh, thousands of samples, um, several um, tens of thousands of samples of frozen cow poop uh, from the cattle industry. And what's ironic that the cattle industry is so driven by, you know, profits that they really, really know about cow nutrition. Uh, they know very well, and they know what cows need to eat to maximize their growth. And uh, by analyzing cow poop, because their sample was so large, they could cut through the noise. And they saw that just over the last, like, two, three decades, the quality, and again, they looked at nitrogen or protein, declined in forage to the point where it affects cow growth. So... Again, uh, you know, nit- decline of nitrogen is much more well-known issue, and uh, I was focusing uh, specifically on minerals. I don't know of studies that directly attributed uh, decline in minerals to animals, but I definitely uh, think that's that's an issue because many animals are uh, limited by minerals. That's why you know they, there's a geophagy where they literally eat earth or lake rocks to obtain those minerals. So uh, we have some evidence that uh, it uh, does affect uh, animals. There's also interesting studies showing that even wild animals, they, they become fatter for some reason. There is, there is a weight gain even in some wild you know, mammals. Uh, and that, that goes back to your question you know, about uh, obesity and uh, other diseases such as diabetes. So I have to tell you that everything you're saying I'm finding frankly horrifying and that I mean this is this is this is it seems terrifying stuff to me and it seems that it hasn't been studied a lot I, I have a sentence here in front of me among thousands of publications that you had reviewed on plants and rising CO2 he found only one that looked specifically at how it affected the balance of nutrients in rice, a crop that pe- the billions of people rely on. And the paper, published in 1997, found a drop in zinc and iron. And well, I guess the first question is, and this is a very unscientific question, but, I mean, do you find this pretty scary? And second... I know that you've said that this is, you know, that the emphasis is primarily on yield, and that's a very good point. 
nonetheless, we have... And, and, I don't understand why there wouldn't be more studies on this. So I guess take any of that where you want to, anywhere you want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know when uh, uh, back in 2001, I started to think that the minerals should decline in plants, uh, just from basic this uh, you know mass balance perspective, and because you know also my my. A PhD thesis was actually about a mathematical model that that looked at the quality of a phytoplankton, and um, you know uh, the the idea was that you know that is you increase light, uh, there is more phytoplankton but lower quality, and that affects zooplankton. So I essentially replaced light with CO2, thinking well CO2 will boost photosynthesis and that would uh, you know make plants worse, and unlike light co2 is increasing globally so that would uh, should affect humans and when i started to look what humans are limited and i realized that billions of people don't get those minerals and the implications for those people are horrendous i know like uh, one example is iodine deficiency right that that actually is the leading cause of uh, preventable lower iq in children and we of course iodize our salt uh, in in developed countries in many countries it's still not iodized and they have goiter and uh, you know the, the retardation and uh, really horrendous uh, same thing with the iron deficiency for for uh, for you know mothers in pregnant women and zinc deficiency that also steals you know the the vitality uh, from from humans and um, uh, that was like, okay, well, um, that's a huge problem. So what then CO2 does to those minerals? And I started to look at the studies, and I was shocked, really. I, I couldn't believe that there was so little. And to me, it was very clear, the connection. But, you know, because I was lucky that I didn't come from this agricultural you know, botanist perspective. I came from mathematics perspective and was fortunate to be introduced to this uh, science uh, that looked at, uh, you know, all the biology from the simple perspective of chemical elements, which was, as I said, was done by James Elser and with his colleague uh, at the University of Minnesota, Bob Sterner. So with that perspective, to me, it was clear, but but uh, very little studies, right. It was one study by uh, Conroy Sinawera in Australia where they looked at rice and, uh, you know, the iron and, and zinc dropped. But maybe in another study, you know, iron would not drop. And so there was a lot of noise in the system, a lot of noise in the system in terms of like, you know, statistical noise. And if I talk to experts, right, they would say, well, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's because in those experiments, plants grow in pots. And if you actually grow them in the fields, they will get all the nutrients they need. They can grow bigger roots. Or they would say, you know, uh, actually one uh, uh, big shot at Princeton University, uh, he actually was one of the few who was interested in the issue. But he told me, look, come on. I mean, you know, humans need so little iron, they could always like little eat a little bit of dirt. And, you know, get all the iron they need because, you know, soil is indeed, uh, uh, is rich in iron, not necessarily bioavailable, but it's rich in iron. So he was a geoscientist and he had no idea about the state of human nutrition and that, you know, there's um, literally two billion people who don't get enough iron. So when experts look from their own perspective, they don't necessarily connect all those dots. And that's why there was this resistance. And so I realized the only way to cut through that is to cut through that noise and have enough data to unequivocally show, okay, look, if we, if we have massive amount of data, we see the signal. We see that a plant quality declines and it declines globally. And since we're already limited by those elements, the situation will be getting worse. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, one of the problems is that uh, by its nature, it is interdisciplinary problem. And unfortunately, a lot of funding usually is for specific disciplines. So it doesn't really fit anywhere to any specific discipline. And that's why I think I encountered so many rejections for my you know, grant applications. So 
I, I'm still not quite clear on uh, what percentage, like how I understand the, the 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 problem of not getting enough zinc or not getting enough iron, but I'm not really clear on how much less zinc or iron mm -hmm. um, there would be in a type of plant. How much less nutrition are we getting from rice or potatoes or whatever whatever you want to choose, soybeans, sure. I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, and how much of that would be attributable, do you think, to CO2? How, how, how much is this hurting nutrients? Sure. So uh, I was collecting all the data from all these experiments that were running on you know, four continents, uh, not only in greenhouses, but in actual fields. And, uh, you know, was about over seven and a half thousand observations, pairs of observations. So total over 15,000 observations for 25 different, um, elements in, uh, you know, 130 plant varieties. And, uh, there is a pervasive, consistent and, uh, geographically widespread decline of nearly all elements on average 8%. Of course, as I said, there is variability. So, uh, you know, anywhere from 5 to 15% uh, decline. And, you know, nitrogen, as, as, as has been known, declines more, maybe 15, you know, 18%. Now, you know, you might say it's not a big deal. You know, what is the 8% decline? And I often hear that, like, you know, it's, we, we, we fortify our foods, uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to add a little bit of zinc. Uh, we actually grow plants in greenhouses, right? Uh, and they're delicious and they're tasty. Uh, why, you know, am I an alarmist who just, you know, uh, just raises, uh, you know, think a non-issue? So what really people are missing here is that they think, you know, it's not one time 8% decline of zinc. You know, if I eat today a cereal that has 8% less zinc or, you know, I eat an apple that has 15% uh, less, less magnesium, that's not an issue at all. Right. Plant plants generally have very variable quality. The problem is it's global lifelong decline with every meal that you eat for all the minerals. Three times a day you eat plants. Every time you eat a salad, a, a pizza, uh, you know, a juice, uh, even a beer or wine um, or, you know, any kind of any kind of plant based food, you would have slightly less nutrients there, those essential minerals. What's the cumulative effect? You know, uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the scary question. Not, not only uh, that, but also the effect is increasing every year because CO2 concentrations are climbing. So it's progressive effect. Now, I want to, uh, you know, know that because very often uh, those, you know, climate deniers or people who who are skeptical, they say we raise food in greenhouse uh, in greenhouses and it's it's and it's nutritious. Yes, I love to eat food from greenhouses, but the problem greenhouses are controlled environment. The, the CO2 there is deliberately increased so plants would grow faster, but the, also soil is enriched. You see, if, if you can balance increase of CO2 and you enrich soil, you can grow more plants and, and you know, nutritious plants. In fact, my original, you know, paper back in 2002, it said about imbalance between CO2 and nutrients. But when we talk about how the vast amount of food is actually grown, in the world. It's not grown in greenhouses. It's grown in open fields where, as you already said, the soil is depleted. Where we don't add zinc, we don't add magnesium, but what we do is we add, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and everywhere for all the plants we just add more CO2. So that's where the, this imbalance in the environment translates into plants and affects us. It's the scale that that is scary. And yeah, and and I, I love what you just said, but even when you said eight percent, 
that did actually sound pretty terrifying to me up front. And I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I mean the you know to me it was you know eight percent. Uh, it's it's uh, okay. Think this way, right? Essentially, those eight percent are replaced. Those minerals are replaced with extra starch and sugar. So when I actually did some calculations that you could you could uh, get the same effect in terms of dilution of nutrients, if you take a spoonful of starch and sugars and you dump it on a you know typical plant serving you eat. Well, imagine doing that for the rest of your life, right? What's the cumulative effect? And uh, that is that is very concerning, and that's where I think, and again, that's unexplored, but I think that's where the link is to possibly diabetes and obesity. You know, the big food industry already adds, injects uh, sugar, uh, which is, you know, one of the cheapest calories or, you know, refined carbs in high fructose corn syrup. It already injects uh, it in our food supply, right, to maximize profits. And here we do it also by increasing CO2, and we do it for all the plants, whether they're wild, whether they're organic, uh, whether they are just commercial crops. So, yeah, I mean, what what we get, it seems, is blown out insulin receptors, uh, yeah, and I think that that you know slightly you know slightly uh, worse quality plants with more starch and sugars and increased carbohydrate to protein ratio, and you know if we talk about carbohydrate to protein ratio, the increase is substantial. Uh, it could be a thirty percent, depending on a plant tissue, could be anywhere from you know five to forty percent. Uh, higher carbs to protein, and we know we know that the carbohydrate to protein ratio does affect uh, weight gain. So we have about six or seven minutes left, mm-hmm. and what what would you? I have a couple, three questions. Mm-hmm. One of them is, what would you if they somehow put you in in charge of the FDA or something? What 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 do you want to see done about this? I mean, a, apart from stopping global warming, what do you want to see done about this? Do you, where where would you like to? For one question, where would you like to see more research? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, uh, on the one hand, I'm not a policymaker, so I'm you know a bit, uh, reluctant to give recommendations. But if I had a magic wand, I would I would change the incentives that. The entire agriculture is driven by yield, and if farmers were paid not just for calories but for the nutritional content, then when you start with those incentives, then they will cascade down. Then the farmers will start to think, well, how can we enrich soil? Should we have a better soil? Should we have more minerals in the soil? And uh, the, the, the nutritional density, nutritional density really that is neglected for so many years, if it comes to the forefront, then um, then the the well-being of all the humans will increase and uh, the, the amount of diseases will decrease. But I, I don't know how to do that, how to change those incentives. So another question, I want to go back to the phytoplankton. And and I wasn't quite clear that the phytoplankton experiments were about increased light. Mm-hmm. But does this increased CO2, do you believe, affect phytoplankton the same way that it affects broccoli? Right, yes. So the fundamentally plants and, you know, phytoplankton, they all called autotrophs, uh, photoautotrophs. They use, uh, you know, sunlight to, to make food. They, they share the same basic, uh, biochemistry. And, uh, uh, right. So whether you increase light or you increase CO2, you increase photosynthesis. And the, the ultimate product of photosynthesis is uh, carbohydrates. Uh, the oxygen that we know, it's just a waste product. You know, plants split the water molecule and just release, release oxygen, but they grab that hydrogen to make, to make sugars. So that's, that scares me very much too, because, you know, phytoplankton is really the base of, we could argue that phytoplankton is one of the bases of life on Earth, since this is mainly a water planet. Yeah, and, definitely, yes. Yeah, as a, and so a decrease in nutrient quality of phytoplankton combined with a decrease in actual quantity of phytoplankton in the oceans. There, there have been studies of decreases in, in phytoplankton 
numbers or volume or however you want to put it, mass, mm -hmm. um, that seems to be to suggest things that are not very good for ocean health. Yeah, I mean the you know the, the quality of phytoplankton changes, uh, and uh, also the you know another effect of CO two is increases uh, acidity of, uh, of of water, so that also affects phytoplankton. In terms of uh, effects, yeah, we 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 do see that there are big changes in terms of the structure of of food webs and uh, uh, you know the whether the, some species adapt or no. And, uh, you know, some of these issues are, are well known, uh, but uh, why I'm concerned about this increase in CO2 because it's such a global, inescapable, pervasive effect that really affects not only uh, marine systems, but also, you know, terrestrial systems and specifically our agriculture and our nutrition. Literally, what you ate today has been already affected by higher CO2 concentration. So I guess I have I have two questions left to finish up. We got just a couple minutes, and one of them, the first question is, so what are you what are you working on now that has to do with this? And the second question is, uh, what would you like for listeners of this interview to take away? Mm -hmm. What what do you want listeners to understand and and do? Mm -hmm. I see. Well, uh, one project I work is fascinating one is about, you know, carotenoids and that is that gives color to nature. If, you know, all the, all this red, green, uh, you know, orange, uh, I mean, not green, but orange, brown and red colors. And, um, uh, you know, I was contacted by a researcher from Ireland, John Nolan, who is expert on carotenoids. And turns out we need carotenoids in our eyes, in our macula. We filter blue light that, that protects our vision. In some way, we and the plants, we share the need for carotenoids to protect, protect against oxidative stress. And uh, he asked me what will happen. Will carotenoids be affected? And I started to look at that. I didn't know anything about carotenoids. Carotenoids, but uh, it's interesting that you know as CO2 increases, it helps plants to uh, reduce stress because there is a basic nutrient. So they actually don't have to produce that many antioxidants. So I think, and this is just hy hypothesis, but we'll have a paper coming up soon that that essentially that carotenoids might decline. So it's not just minerals, but one of the very important nutrients that it has been linked to vision and memory uh, that that might decline uh, as well, or be at least changed. Uh, significantly affected by increasing CO2. So that's a current research project. In terms of what the, you know your listeners should do, as I say, I, I'm not a dietitian or policymaker to give recommendations, but I would just maybe point to a couple of trends, right? Uh, it, it's good to be aware that the big food industry uses high, high fructose corn syrup and sugar to pretty much sweeten everything, right? As you mentioned, it makes things taste better. And so on top of that, now we have this increase in CO2 that also injects extra carbs into the entire biosphere. So be mindful of that, you know, watch the amount of, uh, you know, refined sugars you eat and, and uh, you know, focus on more nutrient uh, dense uh, foods. Well, thank you so much for your work in the world, which is just, I think, incredibly important and incredibly fascinating. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Dr. Irakli Loadze. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.